Okay. So today we are starting our discussion with uh, IS 36 impairment. IS 36 impairment. Uh, you might have studied this IS 36 in your basic F7 or previous papers. But in this advanced level, it is a bit advanced, obviously. So the first thing is, what is the difference between depreciation and impairment? What is the difference between depreciation and impairment? Listen, what is depreciation? Depreciation is basically a systematic, systematic allocation of cost of a non-current asset over its useful life. What does it mean? It means depreciation always follows a system. For example, you buy an asset and if you use it day and night extreme, you do it, you use it extreme, extreme usage. So it will end early. For example, if you use it very fast, so you, it will be depreciated over five years. But if you use it slowly, 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 so you may use it for 10 years. So that means depreciation follows a usage pattern, usage pattern, right? So what is depreciation? To spread the depreciable amount of or cost of a non-current assets over its useful life, right? This is called depreciation. And what is impairment? Impairment is basically sudden fall, sudden fall in the value of a non-current asset is called impairment. Now wait. Let me give you an example. Let us say there is a car accident. You bought, you bought a car and the next day you had a big accident. So because of this accident, the value of the car will fall. So that's not depreciation. This is sudden fall. This is sudden fall. This is impairment. Second example. Uh, let us say you, you bought iPhone 7 and after a year, a new model of iPhone came. So definitely with the new model, with the new technology, the old te technology gets obsolete. So the value of old technology goes down with the introduction of new phone, right? So this is also impairment. This is not depreciation, right? So don't forget the difference between depreciation and impairment. This was the first thing. I hope you have done this in basics as well. Now, next thing. We never, we never book impairment directly. There, there are some steps. First, we got, first we got the hint of impairment. First, we got the hint of impairment, indication of impairment. And whenever we get the hint of impairment, indication of impairment, we do impairment testing. And after that impairment testing, we got to know about impairment is there or not. Giving you an example. You might have heard about uh, diabetes, diabetes. You know, how a person get to know that he's a, he or she is a diabetic patient. First of all, there are some indications in your body. You get some signals in your body. For example, you get, you feel weakness or if you got, if you got a cut in your hand, so it takes time to heal. These are the indications. These are the indications of uh, sugar or diabetes. So when you get these hints, you go for a sugar test, HbA1c, there is a test. And then after the results came, came you come to know about whether you are a diabetic patient or not okay so same is the case here so first you got first you got hint of impairment indication of impairment right then whenever you get hint of impairment you go you do you go you do impairment testing or impairment review and after that impairment test you come to know you get to know whether this asset is impaired or not okay so these are the three steps now how many types of hints are there? I'm just giving you overview right now and we'll tell you in detail about all these. There are two types of hints. Number one is internal hints and number two is external hint. Number one is internal hint and number two is external hint. Internal hints like damage, accident. It, this, is a, this is an internal hint. This will hit only your asset, okay? What is external hint? For example, the changes in technology. You had old laptop, old technology laptop, and there's a new, new, new technology laptop came in the market. So that's because of change in technology, your old technology will be obsolete, right? So there are, there are two types of hints. Number one, internal hints and number two, external hints, right? right? Now, first of all, let me solve a question, a practical question for you so that you understand this whole cycle. You understand this whole cycle. Okay, let's start. For example, uh, you bought a non-current asset. You bought a non-current asset at year zero. Look at the screen for hundred thousand. 
and the life of this non-current asset is 10 years, right? Okay, now you need to depreciate it because the life is finite. The life is finite. Now you have life of 10 years and 100,000 is the cost and no scrap value is written. So simply depreciate it over 10 years. So 100,000 divided by 100,000 divided by 10 years will give you depreciation of 10,000, okay? Now 100,000 minus 10,000, your NBV, your net book value or carrying value, your NBV, net book value or carrying value at the end of year one, at the end of year one is 90,000, okay? Now, at the end of year one, you got, at the end of year one, you got an impairment hint. This is the date, see, this is the date you got the impairment hint. Now, whenever we get impairment hint, we do impairment testing. We do impairment testing. Now, the next question is how we do, how we do impairment testing. Look at me. We go to the asset and we calculate this thing, recoverable amount. We calculate recoverable amount of that asset. We calculate recoverable amount of that asset. Now the student asks, sir, what is, what is recoverable amount? So in simple, easy language, recoverable amount means what is the maximum, maximum benefit we can obtain from that asset. The maximum benefit we can obtain from an, from an asset is called recoverable amount. Now, there are, there are two types of benefit which, which we can obtain from that asset. The first, first of all, we can sell it. We can sell it immediately. We can sell it immediately. So if we sell it, so we'll get fair value, less cost to sell fair value, less cost to sell, right? For example, uh, we can sell the asset for 62,000, but there is a cost to sell. There is a cost to sell of 2000 that will be incurred. So the net benefit we'll, we'll be getting is 60,000, right? So the first benefit is fair value, less cost to sell. The first benefit which we can obtain is by selling it immediately, we can get fair value, less cost to sell, okay? Now, what is the second benefit? The second benefit is no need to sell it. Don't sell it. Keep using this asset. Don't sell that asset. Keep using it, this asset till the end of its useful life. So you will earn, you will earn something from this asset in future. You will earn something from this asset in future. Plus in the end, when after a few years, when this asset will be old, when this asset will be old, you will scrap it and you will get some cash flows from the scrap value as well. So all the future cash flows, whatever the future cash flows you will be getting, you need to compute the present value of it. So value in use is present value of future cash flows, okay? Including disposal cash flows, present value of future cash flows, including disposal cash flows, right? So let us say the present value came out to be 70,000. The present value came out to be 70,000. Now, how do we calculate? Look at the screen and think over it. How do we calculate recoverable amount? Recoverable amount is basically the biggest benefit. And even in our practical life, we also go for a human being also go for maximum benefit, right? So 60,000 is fair value less cost to sell and value in use, value in use is 70,000. Which one is higher? The higher is 70,000. So your recoverable amount is 70,000, right? Now, recoverable amount means the biggest benefit which we can get from that asset, right? Now, very interesting thing. At the end of year one, just think over it. At the end of year one, the net book value or carrying value of this asset is 90,000. The net book value or carrying value of this at asset is 90,000. That means we are showing we are showing this asset to our share, shareholders for 90,000. We are showing this asset to our shareholder for 90,000. But you know, the maximum benefit, the maximum benefit which we can, the maximum benefit which we can obtain from this asset is 70,000. So now take a fair decision, take, take an honest decision. Is this okay? Is this good to report this asset for 90,000? When we have already seen the max, max, maximum benefit which we can obtain from this asset is only 70,000. We can only get 70,000 benefit. So now it's not legitimate to report this asset for 90,000. That means this asset is impaired. This asset has lost his value. This asset has lost his value. So now 
it's mandatory to book 20,000 impairment. It's mandatory to book 20,000 impairment. So see here, I will write here recoverable amount is RA stands for recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is 70,000. So there will be an impairment of 20,000. And for shortcut entry, I can make this entry. Impairment is expense. Impairment is downfall, it's expense. So uh, you can write impairment expense or you can write PNL, profit and loss account debit. Profit and PNL is profit and loss debit. Profit and loss is okay, or you can write impairment expense as well. It's your wish. And the asset credit and name of this asset is PPE. -E. Property, plant, and equipment credit 20,000. PPE credit 20,000. PPE credit 20,000, right? So this is one of the example of impairment. This is one of the example. This is one of the cycle of impairment I did for you, right? Giving you 30 seconds to just grasp it. And if you want to copy it, it's your wish. Otherwise, otherwise, I'll share I'll share these slides with you. Okay, sometimes students ask one question, one very basic question, which you have studied in your basic studies as well. Sir, once we book impairment of an asset, how do we depreciate this asset for future? Very basic question. Uh, it's like the same as revaluation. Listen, once you impair the asset, the value of asset changes. So you see, you can see the asset has come to 90,000 now. The asset has come to uh, 70,000 now, okay? Asset was was at 90,000 and now we we brought this asset from 90 to 70 90 to 70 so the new value so the new value of this asset is 70,000 right now what we do for future years for future years how do we depreciate it this new value divided by remaining life this new value divided by remaining life so what's your total life the total life was initially 10 years so after one year after one year your remaining life will be nine years. So for future depreciation, very simple rule is you, what you do 70,000, 70,000 divided by 70,000 divided by nine years, you will get future depreciation per year. That's it. Okay. Now, look at here. I'm going to change, I'm going to change something, some numbers so that you can understand all the detailed theory lecture. I have to teach all theoretical things as well. Now, let us say, if I change, look at the, look at the screen. Right now, the value in use, value in use is 70,000. Okay, now what is value in use? Can you tell me what is value in use? I just told you orally. The value in use means future cash flows. The value in use means future cash flows, future cash flows. See. Look at here. For example, we are expecting on year one, we are expecting 30,000 from this asset. Year two, we are expecting 70,000. Year three, we are expecting 90,000. These are the future cash flows which we are expecting. Open your eyes. And let us say the interest rate is 10%. So the discount factor is, let us say 0 0.909, 0 0.826. 0.751 you must know the meaning of discount factor you have studied this in your basic studies right okay so when you multiply it when you multiply these numbers when you multiply these numbers 
you will get you will get the present value of future cash flows and when you add this last column this will be your v i u this is your v i u okay so what is your v i u v i u means present value of future cash flows v i u means present value of future cash flows v i u means present value of future cash flows okay getting right so in this way we compute v i u just for a sample i have told you even you know this even you know this before now let me change let me change few things in this question for example look at the screen be careful for example that the value in use of this asset instead of instead of 70000 the value of use of this asset became 65 c originally originally i wrote 70000 viu originally i wrote 70000 as value in use but now i'm changing the number to 65000 now open your eyes that means the viu the viu just decreased the viu just decreased so automatically automatically your recoverable amount will be 65000 now just look at here i just changed the value in use from 70000 to 65 I just changed the value in use from 70,000 to 65. So when the value in use goes down, your recoverable amount also goes down. And now look at here, when your recoverable amount goes down, so now your impairment will be 25,000. Now your impairment will be 25,000, not 20,000. So from these numbers, you can conclude, from this example, you can conclude, look at me. Whenever your VIU goes down, your VIU goes down, your recoverable amount may also go down when your viu goes down your recoverable amount may also goes down and when when your recoverable amount goes down your impairment goes up impairment goes up so in simple terms decrease decrease in value in use because of any reason decrease in value in use because of any reason is an impairment hint decrease of value in use because of any reason is an impairment hint you can, you have just seen that by decreasing value in use, your, you, your, your recoverable amount will go down and automatically your impairment will go up. And what is value in use? And what is value in use? It's, it's basically future cash flows present value. Future cash flows present value. Okay? So don't forget, if your values, you, value in use goes down, your recoverable amount also goes down. And this is, this is one of the impairment hints. And now what is value in use? Well, look at here again, the present value of future cash flows. So now I can say, if your future cash flows goes down, look at here. If your future cash flows goes down, automatically the present value will also go down. If your future cash flows goes down, automatically your present value also goes down. Automatically your present value also goes down. So your VIU will also go down. So future cash flows, future cash flows of the asset. If, if we come to know, we get to know, by any reason future cash flows of asset will go down so that means that means that's also that that's also an impairment hint that's also an impairment hint giving you 30 seconds to think over it Okay, now I told you I'll discuss all these theoretical points with you, all these theoretical points with you, which you can see on your screen. Look at here. I just told you there are two types of hints. One is internal hints and one second is external hints. Okay, first let me clarify you one thing. I'm using the word hints. Hints is also indication. Okay. It doesn't mean this is actual impairment. This may result in impairment. These are hints. These are indications. And whenever you get hint, whenever you get indication, you check it, you check it, you check it, whether is there is an impairment or not, or you, or in simple words, you do impairment review, you do impairment test. Whenever, whenever there is a hint, you, you go and you go for a checkup. 
you go for a checkup right okay so let's let's start the first hint is damage the first internal hint is damage this is very simple and clear it's the it's like accident or bomb blast these all these all are the hints plane crash plane crash these all are impairment hints it's damage all change in use of asset change in use of asset is also impairment hint now giving you one example let us say we we have a transport company look at here we have a transport company and we were the owners of different buses so first uh, right now our buses used to follow this x route right now our buses used to follow this x route so the, these areas these areas through which x route uh, our buses travels right now is full of rush it's full of people highly populated densely populated areas so normally lot of people uses our bus so automatically we are earning more right but now our board of directors our board of directors decided that now our bus will go in y route our bus will go to y route and let us say the y route there is very less they are very less populated areas in y route these are very less populated area very few people live in these areas it's like a jungle or not a downtown type area right okay so automatically by changing the route by changing the route by changing the change the use of asset now our future cash flows will be affected we will have less future cash flows so just think i just taught you when we will have less future cash flows so automatically our present value of future cash flows will also go down and when the present value of future cash flows go down the value in use goes down so yes change use of asset change in use of asset is one of the hint of impairment changes in use of asset is one of the hint of impairment okay now the third hint plan to sell an asset plan to sell an asset plan to sell an asset what is this soon after this i is will be doing ifrs 5 held for sale you know sometime we decide we decide we take decision to sell an asset so whenever you take a decision to sell an asset this is also a question mark this is also a question mark on that asset that what is the problem with that asset that why you are saying that you want to sell it that means there is something there is some problem in this asset asset go and check it there is some pro, there is something bad in this that asset that's why you are planning to sell it that's why you are not you don't want to keep it with you so this is also this is also hint of hint of impairment okay just hint i am using the word hint only hint i am not saying it's impairment it's hint of impairment okay one more thing i tell you sometimes you stop using an asset this is what we call it abundant assets abundant assets abundant assets it means you decided to not to use this asset for 2 years because there are no usage so this is also impairment hint why because the remaining life of the asset was 10 years and you were expecting that you will earn over all, over the period of 10 years but now as you have decided that for the next 2 years for the next 2 years you are going to stop the usage so if you don't use it for next two years you won't earn a single penny from that asset for next two years so automatically your future cash flows will be disturbed and when your future cash flows will be disturbed there this is an, this is the hint of impairment now for external hints number one changes in technology i already taught you changes in technology not an issue number two changes in legal economic environment changes in legal economic environment yes sometimes government passes a certain laws government passes certain restrictions government po imposes import duties or something like that so because of that our business hits adversely so this is also impairment hint uh, you might have heard that uh, in 2020 or 2019 uh, donald trump in united states donald trump imposed there was a trade war between china and us so donald trump imposed some duties or some restrictions of trade with china 
so automatically this is this is also an impairment hint for those people who are doing business with china who are totally dependent on chinese products right okay now the next point this is very interesting increase in interest rates okay you know this paper is connected with your basic papers as well in the basic papers you have done the financial management financial management area okay so let's tell let me teach you a little little rules of discounting why increase in interest rate why increase in interest rate is impairment hint why increase in interest rate is impairment hint look at here right now the interest look at here the, the sample this is the sample which i have shared with you this is the sample i have used the interest rate as 10% with 10% with 10% interest rate the discount factors are 0 0.909 0 0.826 0 0.751 okay so let us say state bank or the central bank central bank revises or increases the interest rate look at here central bank increases the interest rate to 20% central bank increases the interest rate to 20% so when interest rate increases you know this or you can use it your calculator so your discount see your discount factor goes down uh, let us say right now it's 0 0.909 this will become 0 0.8 this will become 0 0.7 this will become let us say 0 0.6 so this is the basic basic thing basic rule whenever interest rate means cost of cost of funds goes up so your discount factor goes down and now just think when your discount factors goes down your present value will also go down and when your present value goes down your value in use will be affected your viu will be affected your value in use will be affected your value in use will go down and yes this is the hint of impairment yes this is the hint of impairment. Okay, be active, be active, be active, please. Now the last point, this is a little bit technical point, but don't worry you have studied in your basic studies is this point as well carrying value of net assets greater than market capitalization now for some students market capitalization is a new word market capitalization is a new word still you have studied this word in your basic studies as well what is market capitalization market capitalization means total number of shares multiplied by share price total number of shares of any company multiplied by stock market share price market price of that company market price per share of that company number of shares multiplied by market price per share of that company okay wait let me explain you this for example this is the SOFP of a company you have total assets of 1 lakh this company has total assets of 1 lakh and you have shareholder equity shareholder equity of 70,000 plus liabilities of 30,000 so automatically it becomes hundred thousand okay i hope you can see and you know when whenever we make sofp or balance sheet sofp or balance sheet the we we use one equation assets is equal to capital plus liabilities openly you can see a, a is equal to c plus l a is equal to c plus l assets assets is equal to equities owners equities plus liabilities right this is the this is the condition of our is this company's balance sheet x company's balance sheet okay now look at here x company has issued total hundred thousand shares total number of shares total number of shares issued by this company total number of shares issued by this company is hundred thousand shares okay go slow and you know the share price share price per share is five dollars that means in the stock market people are ready to buy 
each share people are ready to buy each share of this company for just dollar five so what is the worth of this company what is the worth of this company let me change one thing uh, total number of shares are 10,000 we'll make it 10,000 okay I'm changing it total number of shares issued by this company is 10,000 and what is the share price it's just five dollars per share not that means if somebody wants to buy the hundred percent company if somebody wants to buy hundred percent of this company how he'll buy it? ten thousand multiplied by five is fifty thousand ten thousand multiplied by five is fifty thousand this is called market capitalization this is called market capitalization means market capitalization means total number of shares multiplied by share price total number of shares multiplied by share price okay so what does it mean that means if anybody wants to buy the hundred percent of this company hundred percent company if you want to buy hundred percent company you will buy all shares so you you need you are you need to pay just fifty thousand fifty thousand dollars and the complete equity will be yours you know whenever we take over whenever we buy a running business a complete business we buy the equity we buy the equity so in the market People are just ready to pay. People are just ready to pay only 50,000 for the whole equity of this company. In the market, people are just ready to pay 50,000 for the whole equity of this company. But, but, but look at here. In the company's balance sheet, we are reporting the equity for 70,000. In the company's SOFP, we are reporting the total equity for 70,000. But the real worth, but the real worth, but the real worth of this company, this whole company, this whole company's equity is just 50,000 in the market. So that means there is a question mark. There is a big, big, big question mark on this company that there is something bad. There is something bad. This company needs impairment test. This company needs impairment test. Just think over it that we are reporting uh, uh, the equity in the balance sheet in the SOFP. We are reporting the equity for 70,000. But in the market, people are just ready to pay only 50,000. That means our equity is overstated. Things are overstated in the company. Things need to be need to come down. Things need to be impaired. Not getting. Think over it. Giving you time. Think over it. Okay, please have a look. So whatever till now, till now we have just studied the basic. Till now we have just studied the basic. We discussed audience, please, audience students, please look at me. We discussed the difference between depreciation and impairment. Then I, I told you that we never book impairment directly first we get the hint of impairment first we get the hint or indication of impairment whenever we get hint or indication of impairment we do impairment testing we do impairment review okay right and how we do impairment review we compute recoverable amount of that asset we compute recoverable amount of that asset okay right then and and after computing recoverable amount, we, we compare it with NBV. We compare it with net book value or carrying value of that asset. And then we come to know whether there is impairment or not. Okay. One more thing. There are two types of hints. One is internal hints and one is one is external hints. Both hints are in front of you. You can see both of the hints are in front of you. You can see you can have a look. And I've also explained you.
now telling you one very famous dialogue and you have to write it you can write it as well see right now in my first example the nbv the nbv was 90000 that means at the end of year 1 when we when we got the hint of impairment the carrying value was 90000 and the recoverable amount the recoverable amount of that asset was 70000 so don't forget this thing whenever you can write it as well whenever your carrying value is greater than recoverable amount whenever your carrying value is greater than recoverable amount impairment is must whenever your carrying value is greater than impairment in sorry whenever your carrying value is greater than recoverable amount impairment is must must and must write it down whenever the carrying value of your asset is greater than recoverable amount impairment is must or i can also write it for you Okay, if you want to write this statement, you can. Whenever carrying value of asset is greater than recoverable amount, impairment is must. Okay, now we are moving towards the advanced ver version of this IS. Till now, what we discussed was all, all basic level. You have studied in basic level as well. Now I will discuss some advanced points. Okay. First of all, you know this recoverable amount, recoverable amount is higher of two things. Recoverable amount is higher of two things. One is fair value less cost to sell. The first benefit which we can obtain, the second benefit is value and use value and use means present value of future cash flows because when we, we come to value and use we think that we are not selling the asset right now we are not selling this asset right now but we'll keep using it but we'll keep using it for future future and this asset will generate future cash flows to us okay including the final disposal cash flow done so few important points and the advanced points for you first of all look at the screen fair value minus cts means fair value less cost to sell now the first point in case in case of binding sale agreement use bid price instead of fair value in, in case of binding sale agreement use bid price instead of fair fair value look at look at here you can see the one pen in, in my hand can you see this pen please look at the video for example i have i have i have made a binding contract with some party that i will sell this uh, pen with, to you for 100 dollars i have done a binding contract with a certain party that i'll sell this pen to you guys for 100 dollars okay the agreement has been done so that means now finally i will get 100 pounds only 100 pounds from this pen okay the contract has binding contract has been done now what if in these days the fair value of this pen becomes 120 dollars the fair value rises and the fair value of this pen becomes 120 dollars so no issue still if the fair value is 120 dollars i will still get 100 dollars because i have done the binding sale agreement with the other party so I'll be, I'll be receiving $100 fix. 
So now fair value is not relevant for me. Now bid price, the agreement price is relevant for me. Okay. So in this case, read it in case of binding sale agreement, use bid price, use bid price instead of use bid price instead of instead of fair value, right? Okay. Think over it. Second point, second point related to this for non transferable asset for non transferable asset. Fair value is irrelevant. Very good for non transferable assets. Sometimes what happens government gives us license or something for only only for us and government tells us that only you can use you can use this asset. You cannot sell it. You cannot sell it. That means there is no option to sell it. The door of selling is been closed. You can't sell it. So now the fair fair value is irrelevant. You because you can't take advantage by selling it. You can only use it. You can only use it. So read it. For non-transferable asset, fair value is irrelevant. For non-transferable asset, the fair value is irrelevant. These two points don't forget. It came in the uh, last ten years past papers. Okay. Read it. Read it. Read it and think over it. Now value in use. Value in use. What is value in use? Think over it. Value in use means value in use means present value of future cash flows. Present value of future cash flows which we will obtain from that asset. Now, some instruction from IS 36. Open your eyes. Future capital expenditure and their related and their related revenue irrelevant what does it means for example i have a two story building i have a two story building and i need to compute impairment i need to calculate viu for that two story buildings listen but i am saying that i have planned that after two years i'll i'll construct a third floor after two or three years i'll construct a third floor on this that means I'll do a future capital expenditure. Now standard says standard says that 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 future expenditure is not committed right now. There is no guarantee that you will do it or not. There is you are just saying it. There is no guarantee that you will be doing that or not. So definitely you need to ignore that future capital expenditure. Don't include don't include that future capital expenditure that future capital expenditure in the calculation of VIU and also their related re revenue when you when you are thinking when you are thinking that after two years you will construct a third floor then you will also think that th uh, this third floor will generate this much revenue this third floor will go on rent and we'll earn this and this from that that's also not allowed so don't forget neither we have to take the future capital expenditure nor their related revenue nothing 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 okay number second point always ignore interest cash flows interest cash flow and tax cash flow very important line and it came in past paper as well if you have studied if you have studied the financial management paper like f9 and ACA, f9 and acca or in ICW, there is also a basic paper of financial management. You know the rule of discounting. Whenever we do discounting using interest rate, whenever we do discounting using interest rate, automatically the impact of interest, the impact of finance cost, all, all automatically comes in that discounting. Automatically comes in that discounting. So we never, never include the interest cash flows in discounting procedure. We never include the interest or finance cost cash flow in the discounting procedure number one number two why standard says the tax cash flows the tax cash flows also need to be ignored why because the interest rate which we use 
the interest rate which we use for discounting is before tax interest rate is before tax interest rate so when interest rate is before tax so the cash flows are also before interest no need to before tax sorry the interest rate which we are using is before tax right the discount rate is before tax that's why the cash flows in cash flows we also don't include we also don't include the tax cash flows to make comparison like with like this is the logic this is the logic next thing the very important for viu for viu for viu take cash flows of next 5 years only this is a very special instruction just think over it practically can you calculate can you calculate it? just look at your surrounding can you calculate next 5 next 2 years cash flows for your business no it's it's a time of high uncertainty you can it's very difficult to see the future so if you say that i will i will look at i will calculate the future 20 years cash flow so it's it's next to impossible or it becomes very highly uncertain thing that's why standard has restricted standard has said that you have to take next 5 years cash flows but yes there is an exemption for this rule if you are look at me if you are certain if you are certain that your cash flows are fixed for the whole life for next 20 years or you have a certain cash flows then you can use more than 5 years as well then you can use more than 5 years as well yes then you can use but for that you have to give disclosure for that you have to give disclosure that your cash flows are very reliable your cash flows are totally reliable now the next thing use decreasing rate growth rate for future cash flows now hold 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 whenever you we you plot you plot future cash flows you forecast future cash flows you always you always assume a a growth rate that through which rate you are growing so you know to be prudent standard says use decreasing use decreasing growth rate you dec use decreasing growth rate for future cash flows this is the basic instruction this is the basic instruction but yes again 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 if you have some competitive edge of it or if you have something extraordinary with you then you can use increasing growth rate but for that you have to give disclosure for that you have to give disclosure that this specialty you have this specialty you have and because of this especially you can you can use increasing growth rate okay for example you have uh, there are different institutes and you have some special teachers very superstar teachers so you can say that because of this these 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 teachers uh, your future revenue is fixed your future revenue is outstanding or you uh, one more example all the industry is doing local work but your your institution is doing online work as well so online means the whole world whole world may be your client right so you need to give the reason reason for that if whole industry is booking impairment and we are not then disclosure yes 2008 giving you example of 2008 2008 was a subprime loan crash hope you remember then in the united states it was a big crash so at the, and especially for the banking sector it was a nightmare right so majority banks were booking impairment so if we are not, we are also one of the bank and if we are not booking the impairment so obviously auditor will object auditor will say why you are not booking the impairment so we'll we'll say that this is the reason that we have this much cash flows for future or we have this much competitive edge that's why that's why we are not booking so again you need to disclose again you need to disclose this fact now very very excellent point excellent point this is very excellent point and i have seen in many past papers you know if you listen to me right now attentively your past paper thing will be very easy also if there is any negative variance in past cash flows incorporated in current analysis wait you know you constantly do impairment in past years as well and now as well because hints hint in impairment hints in this in this shaky environment in impairment hints can may come any time 
So for example, three years back, three years back, you did impairment testing and you computed VIU value in use. So three years back, when you computed value in use, you assume this much growth rate, but with the passage of time, that growth rate proved to be wrong. You were expecting that you would, you would grow with 10%, but in reality, you just grew by 2%. So now you have a past data. Now you have a past data and you have a past history of negative variances, negative variances. So auditor won't leave you now. Auditor won't leave you now. Auditor will tell you to incorporate that past experience. Now, now don't keep, now don't use big, big, big future cash flows. Don't expect high future cash flows, high revenues, because you are, you have a bad history. You have a bad history of predictions. Okay. So this is very important point and I've seen this point in many past papers. Also disclose the assumption used in making cash flows. Yes, yes, yes. Whenever you plot future cash flows, you assume you make different assumptions. You make different assumptions that we are assuming this, this and this. So yes, you have to disclose the, those assumptions as well. You have to disclose those assumptions as well. Now giving you few minutes, you can have a look. Now the next issue, look at here, you know, this also came in one of the past paper I saw, you know, for value and use calculation, you need to use, you need to do discounting for value and use calculation. You need to do discounting and for discounting, my dear student, you, you must use interest rate for discounting. You must use interest rate. Okay, so which interest rate to be used, which interest rate to be used. If you have studied F9, like uh, F9 means the basic financial management paper, you, you remember these points. Look at me, first look at me. You know, interest, uh, uh, there is a famous dialogue. There is a very famous saying, greater the risk, greater the return. There's a very famous saying, greater the risk, greater the return. Okay, giving you first example. One guy came to me and he asked loan. So if his credit worthiness is excellent, he's a very rich guy. Plus he, he's giving me some assets for security. So I might only charge the market rate. Let us say the market interest rate is 10%. So I, I, I may give him loan for 10% because he's not that much risky. But the, on the same moment, the other guy, one more guy came to me and he asked, he also asked the loan, but look at here. He also, Ask the loan, but he is a very risky guy, no good history, not a rich man, not good business, very bad credit worthiness. So because of these risky things, I may charge 15% interest, 10 plus five, 10 plus five, 10 is the market interest rate and 5% and 5% is the risk premium. So in simple terms, the greater the risk, greater the return. Okay. You getting the point. So now let us say I am a big conglomerate or you can say I have many businesses. I'm a big giant multinational, a big company with many subsidiaries, with many businesses. I have, for example, if I give you example in Pakistan, 
in pakistan there is a group lucky group you might have heard about lucky group so lucky group is in cement as well lucky group is in textile as well lucky group is in mall they have mall as well lucky one mall uh, lucky group uh, has uh, the food business as well lucky food right similarly if we talk about the us there are there are many conglomerates in us as well uh, but Berkshire Hathaway like there is one very famous and Virgin Virgin company Virgin Atlantic and this is also a big conglomerate so now you think just think are the risk of textile sector and cement sector is same are the risk of textile sector and cement sector is same the answer is no so just think if i am doing impairment testing for textile sector the interest rate should be different if i am doing impairment testing for cement sector the impairment testing should be different definitely so what is the first point the first point is always the first point is look at here always use project specific discount rate the very excellent point always use project specific discount rate according to the project right if the project is high risky use higher higher rate number 2 what if what if if project is specific read the blinds if project is specific discount rate not possible then use current market interest rate with the inclusion of different risk with the inclusion of different risk for example different risk means the currency risk the country risk what do you mean by country risk for example i have my business in three countries like turkey india and pakistan right so the risk of turkey is different the risk of india is different so these all risk we need to incorporate it okay and the third and the third and the last if first two points are not possible then one more thing is also allowed you you must know this these names you can use your own vac weighted average cost of capital w a double c you can use you can also use your own vac weighted average weighted average cost of capital you can use your weighted average cost of capital okay but the very very interesting point but current vac you have to use your current vac not old vac i have written a reference of past paper 2011 this came in 2011 past paper in sbr in acca acca p2 paper p2 paper which is now sbr okay this came i think the name of that past paper was scramble now they have changed the name as well okay let me just just give one insight of that past paper in that question what they were saying that uh, there was a scenario relating to impairment testing and there is no there was no project specific discount rate was available so what he said in the question the accountant that uh, as a project specific discount rate is not available we are using we are using our own vac but we are using the 2 years old vac we are using our 2 years old vac and you know what reason he gave he said as uh, in last 2 years we 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 didn't need we didn't we didn't need to generate any new loans we di we didn't need any new funds so we didn't issue any new loan notes or like this so that's why we are using 2 years old discount rate so you this was their mistake that's not allowed you have to use the current vac you have to use the current vac not 2 years old vac because 2 years back your credit worth your credit worthiness may be different and now your credit worthiness is different okay so never use the past vac you have to use the current vac okay because you are doing impairment testing today today please have a look have a look have a look have a look have think over it think over it these all are technical issues
again one thing related to the past one thing related to the basic past okay now in the beginning of the lecture in the beginning of lecture i said three steps of impairment number one first we get impairment hint or indication first we get impairment hint or indication and whenever we get impairment hint or indication we do impairment testing right so that means in my original lecture I dependent the impairment testing or impairment review on the hint that first we get first of all we get impairment hint first of all we get impairment hint and then we do and then we do impairment testing okay but dear students don't forget there are three assets in this world there are according to is 36 there are three assets for which for which impairment look at the wordings impairment testing at least annually is must at least annually is must whether you get the hint or not even if you don't get any hint still you have to do impairment testing at least annually for these three assets at least annually for these three assets this you studied in your basic studies as well number one is purchased goodwill purchased goodwill business combination you remember the consolidation consolidation when parent company acquires the running business of subsidiary so parent company used to pay goodwill so in that case that goodwill that goodwill you need to you need to do impairment testing at least annually for that goodwill number two intangible asset intangible asset with indefinite life intangible asset with indefinite life again you have to do impairment testing at least annually and the third thing is intangible asset not yet available for use intangible asset not yet available for use giving you one example i hope you got it you will understand it capitalized development cost in is 38 in your basic studies even in this these studies i'll also teach you is 38 in the in your basic studies is 38 hope you remember the capitalized development cost so until and unless you launch the project until and unless you launch your development project you, you don't depreciate it so that's what we call intangible asset not yet available for use but again i say just remember the names of these three don't don't do any panic and don't take any tension just remember the name of these three right now because this is your beginning lectures right okay so with with the passage of time you will come to know the logic or i give you one more logic for this why why standard has made mandatory that for these three assets the impairment testing is must at least annually because these are the three assets which we don't appreciate see goodwill we don't appreciate intangible asset with indefinite life we don't appreciate till the life is indefinite and intangible asset not yet available for use we don't appreciate because it's not yet available for use so that's why standard has made that's why standard has made compulsory at least annually impairment testing okay one more thing i'm using the word impairment testing not impairment you just need to check it for impairment at least at least a year okay impairment testing at least annually is must for these three assets if you want to note it down you can if you want to write you may Okay. So now we are moving forward. We are moving forward with a very good question. Uh, what is the difference between revaluation and impairment? What is the difference between revaluation and impairment? What is the difference between revaluation and impairment? This question, you know, uh, some employers ask during interview. Okay, so you must know this. So, in very basic terms, look at here. Revaluation. It's an option. It's a choice. I hope you remember IS sixteen. In IS sixteen, you guys studied two models: the cost model. The first one is cost model, and the second one is revaluation model. The first one is 
cost model and the second one is revaluation model right look at here you know out of these two models if you pick revaluation model it's your it's totally your choice it's an option it's your wish if you want to pick revaluation model you may or you leave it so it's not mandatory revaluation is not mandatory revaluation is option it's a choice but go look at here impairment it's must it's must even if you are using cost model if you even if you are using cost model if there is a there is a hint or if, it, if there is a downfall in recoverable amount you, you have to book impairment at any cost so impairment is not a choice impairment is not a choice even if you are using cost model still you need to book impairment once your recoverable amount goes down you have to book impairment no option so impairment is not an option yes revaluation is an option number two second for second line i'll use some practical wordings practical example as well okay revaluation loss is assumed loss revaluation loss is assumed loss impairment loss is real or genuine loss revaluation loss is assumed loss Re impairment loss is real 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 genuine loss now student asks sir what is the logic i i say wait let me give you a logic Tell, telling you logic look at here for example Okay, guys, please, please, please. For example, you have an asset with a carrying value. You have an asset with a carrying value of 100. See, your NBV, your NBV is 100 right now. And you are using cost model. The first case is you are using cost model. Okay. Okay. And now you have the fair value of asset is 90. Cost to sell is 5. Whereas the value in use, VIU is 115. Now, giving you 30 seconds, I'm keep quiet. Uh, in cost model, at what value you will report at the year end? In cost model, at what value you will report this asset at year end? Come on, come on, do it, do it. Okay, so it, first of all, in cost model, you don't need any requirement of revaluation. So forget about the revaluation. Okay, the fair value thing, leave it. But yes, in cost model, we do impairment testing. Let's do it, let's do it. So for impairment testing, we compute recoverable amount. We compute recoverable amount RA and RA is higher of these two. See, your value in use is, is 115 and your fair value less cost to sell is 85. Okay, 90 minus five is 85. Now open your eyes, open your eyes and think. 115 and 85, which one is higher? 115 and 85, which one is higher? Obviously, 115 is higher, right? So the recoverable amount is 115. Okay, open your eyes. And your carrying value is 100. Your NBV, your NBV is 100. Now think over it. Your NBV is 100 and recoverable amount is 115. No need to do any impairment. We do impairment. We do impairment where when your carrying value is higher and your recoverable amount is lower. When your carrying value is higher and your recoverable amount is lower. So in this, in this question with cost model, you don't need any impairment. And when you don't need any impairment, your asset will be reported at 100 rupees at 100 okay so this is the answer this is the first answer please have a look have a look
now revaluation model look at here with revaluation model with revaluation model again you do impairment testing if you do impairment testing look at here so 100 is the nbv 100 is the nbv and recoverable amount is 115 recoverable amount is 115 so no need to no need to do any impairment no need to do any impairment open your eyes now the things are little bit technical but with the look at here but with the revaluation model now you have a policy you have a policy to report asset at fair value not fair value less cost to sell improve your concept with the revaluation model now it's your policy now it's your policy to report asset is fair at fair value is 16 says you to report at fair value you have to report at fair value because of revaluation model because of just because of this policy so now your nbv is 100 and look at here and the fair and the fair value and the fair value is 90 c and the fair value is 90 c your nbv is 100 and your fair value is 90 and you have to you have to bring this asset to fair value because just because of your policy just because of the policy of revaluation so you will report this asset to 90 in this question you will have, you will report it to fair value and when you report and when open your eyes and when you report this 100 dollars asset to 90 dollars you have to book you have to book 10 dollars loss so you will make entry pnl debit and property plan and equipment credit 10 dollars pnl debit 10 dollars and property plan and equipment 10 dollars this is for revaluation model this is for revaluation model you have to report it at 90 you have to report it at 90 just because of your policy now get ready for a big understanding listen 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 this time you book 10 dollars loss this time in the revaluation model you book 10 dollar loss just because of your policy so this is not a real loss this is not a genuine loss if you see the big picture of the question still one thing is very good viu is excellent asset has not gone down from every side one side of the asset is still active viu is good this is just because of fair value downfall just because of the current fair value downfall you book this loss so this is assumed this is assumed loss whereas impairment is a real loss why because when we do impairment we we check the recoverable amount and recoverable amount we look at both side in recoverable amount we look at the value in use as well as the fair value that means that is the real downfall that's the real downfall and in the revaluation model we look at in the revaluation model we look at only one side see in this case only the fair value is down the other side is up the other side is good but still we have to book the fair value loss still we have to book this 10 dollars loss because of our policy because of our policy that's why we say that's why we say revaluation loss is assumed loss impairment loss is a genuine genuine real loss i hope you got the point everything is in front of you you can copy or you can think over it now the next topic is reversal of impairment the next topic is reversal of impairment uh reversal of impairment means once you book once you book impairment and if the factors goes reverse in the future can you book the reversal yes yes it's allowed so let's do 
first of all first of all let's do reversal of impairment using cost model reversal of impairment using cost model but let me teach you a very very basic thing and i hope all of you knows this about the cost model look at here for example for example you bought an asset for 1000 and the life of that asset is 10 years okay so at in the first year you will do depreciation of 100 in the year two you will do depreciation you'll book depreciation of another 100 so at the end of year two the nbv will be 800 okay look at here 1000 less 100 less 100 nbv is at 800 now open your eyes in cost model at any cost you can never cross this 800 you can never take this asset above the nbv because if you take it above the nbv then this will you will you will get into the borders of revaluation model you will get into the revaluation model not getting in the cost model we record asset as co at cost less accumulated depreciation so original cost is 1000 and the two years accumulated depreciation is 100 plus 100 is 200 so obviously at the end of year two the nbv is 800 now you cannot record this asset above 800 at the end of year two if you are using cost model because if you take this asset above 800 so that means you are going you are going in the boundaries of revaluation model that's only allowed in revaluation model and this is called this is also called historical nbv this is also called original nbv or historical nbv this is the name original cost less accumulated deficit is also called historical nbv or original nbv Okay, let's start this. It's not that much difficult, be confident. Now, for example, at year zero, you bought an asset for 1000. At year zero, you bought an asset for 1000, right? And the life of this asset is 10 years. Done. So 1000 divided by 10 depreciation is 100 at the end of year one the nbv is 900 okay now let us say go very simple and now i'm not going to teach you the basic impairment you have done the basic lecture let us say at the end of year one you got an impairment hint and whenever we get impairment hint we compute the recoverable amount so we compute the recoverable amount to be 630, 630. Look at here, direct, direct recoverable amount is given. Now I'm not going to teach you how to calculate recoverable amount. I already taught you. So the NBV is 900 and the recoverable amount is 630 and the recoverable amount is 630. So there is, there is an impairment. There is an impairment of 270 immediate. Okay. There is an impairment of 270. And this impairment is for sure is an expense. Expense, not making the double entry, not making the double entry right now, but for sure this impairment is an expense. We all know this, right? Expense debit or property plan and equipment credit. You can make the entry as well. Now, whenever look at here whenever we, you you revalue or impair an asset whenever you revalue or impairment impair an asset you do depreciation using the updated value now what is the updated value from 900 we brought this asset to 630 from 900 we brought this asset to 630 okay so now the new value is 630 and how to calculate the how to calculate the future depreciation look at here by using this new value divided by remaining life so new depreciation will be 630 divided by you can see you can see the original life of the asset was 10 years 
original life of the asset was 10 years and one year has been passed. So the remaining life is nine years. 630 divided by nine, 630 divided by nine is 70. 670 divided by nine is 70. So your depreciation here is 70 and also at year three, it's also 70. Okay. So very simple. Now at the end of year three, can you, can you guys calculate NBV for me? Can you guys calculate NBV at the end of year 30, year three? What will be the NBV? 630 minus 70 minus 70. 630 minus 70 minus 70. I think it's 490. Yes. Now open your eyes. Let us say at the, we are using cost model. Don't forget cost model. Let us say at the end of year three, conditions changed. The factors because of which we book impairment has got reversed. So now there is a hint. There is, there is a, a hint of reversal of impairment. So what is the procedure? Open your eyes, easy things. Whenever we get, whenever we get impairment hint, we compute recoverable amount, yes. And whenever we get the hint of reversal, we also compute recoverable amount. Whenever we get the reversal hint, hint or hint of reversal, we also compute recoverable amount. So now when I computed recoverable amount, it came to be 580, 580. It came to be 580, okay? So at the end of year three, I, I repeat my words. At the end of year three, we got the hint of reversal of impairment. And what we do, what we do, when we, whenever we get the reversal hint, we also compute the recovery amount. So I did. Now, the, the question of a student is, sir, sir, how will we book? How will we book reversal of impairment? How will we book reversal of impairment? Uh, are there any rules for cost model? Yes. Look at here. Reversal of impairment is totally allowed. Reversal of impairment is full time allowed. See, right now we are at 490. Right now we are at 490 and we need to reverse means we need to go up. Reversal of impairment is full time allowed, but always mind there is a border. There is a border which you cannot cross at any cost. I repeat my words. Sir, is reversal of impairment allowed in cost model? Yes, yes, yes. Reversal of impairment is allowed. You can take asset upward, but there is a border which you can, which you are not allowed to cross. There is a border which you are not allowed to cross. And that name of that border is historical NBV. And the name of that border is historical NBV or original NBV. Historical carrying value or original carrying value. And what is the definition? What is the definition? The definition is carrying value had there been no impairment in past. What do you mean by historical NBV? What do you mean by historical NBV or original NBV? It means carrying value had there been no impairment in past. Carrying value had there been no, no, no impairment in past. Let's calculate it. Let's calculate it. Easy. Look at the screen. We, we bought asset for 1000. Year one, the depreciation was 100. And what if, just think, what if, if, if there is no impairment here, so the depreciation, the depreciation here is also 100 and here depreciation is also 100. If there is no impairment at the end of year one, so the future depreciation will also be 100 and 100. So what would be the NBV? What would be the NBV if there had been no impairment in past? That would be 1000 less 300. 1000, 1000 less 300, that is 700. 700 is your historical NBV, your historical NBV, your border, your border is 700. Okay. So I repeat my words in cost model. Are we allowed, are we allowed to do reversal? Yes, you can do, but you are not supposed to cross this border. 
within this border you can play you can play within this border you can play now the question of student sir 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 why why is 36 why standard has made this border why we cannot cross this border because the answer is very simple because if you cross this border you will go you will you will you will, you will step into the revolution model if you cross this border you will step into the revolution model because only in revaluation model you can cross original mpv i just told you before okay so now you tell me right now your mpv is 490 or right now what is the what is the recoverable amount the recoverable amount is 580 so how much is the change look at here the change is 490 plus uh, 4 we have to go from 490 to 580 the change is 90 yes this is allowed because this is inside the border this is inside the border yes this reversal is allowed and what will be the entry what will be the entry of this reversal look at here uh, from 490 to 580 from 490 to 580 it's a 90 dollar upward so we'll make the entry ppe debit 90 and pnl income income credit 90 okay pp debit 90 and pnl credit 90 now a student may ask the question sir sir can't we book revaluation reserve no 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 it's cost model it's cost model you can't even think of revaluation reserve revaluation reserve is only booked in revaluation model not cost model okay so the entry will be ppe debit ppe and credit pnl debit ppe and credit pnl right so i repeat my words is reversal of impairment allowed in cost model yes it is allowed but there is a border there is a border which you cannot cross within this border you can play so in this question yes you are inside the border so you are you can easily do reversal okay please copy it i will change the requirement now Copy it, please. Or one more thing, you can copy it by clicking pause on this lecture and then you can copy it, okay? So whenever you see the recording, you can use the pause button and then you can copy so you can maintain your own register. Still, still, we'll provide you the slides, all these PDF slides, no issue. requirement number two reversal of impairment if recoverable amount at the end of year three would be 760 now see i've changed the requirement 
Revert now again you need to compute compute re reversal of impairment. Again, you need to compute reversal of impairment if if the recoverable amount, if the re same all, all the data is same, if the recoverable amount, if the recoverable amount is 760, 760. Look at here. That means that means now open your eyes. Your current NBV is 490 and your border, your border is 760, 700. You know, your, your historical NBV is 700. And now your recoverable amount is 760. That means your recoverable amount is outside your border. Your recoverable amount has just crossed your border. So what you do, what you do, look at here. You go up, up, look at here. You go up, up, up and here the guards will stop you. Here the guards will say, no, 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 you can't, you can't go, you can't go further, you can't go further. So this time, this time, maximum you can do 210. This is the max. This is the max you can do. This time, your reversal of impairment will be only 210. This time, your reversal of impairment will be only 210. And so you will make the entry. See, for this time, you'll make the entry. This is your max, max. Okay, so this is the requirement of second and I, I will ask one last question and then we'll end the class. I have one last very interesting question. Now, I have a very, very good question with good learning for you. See, in our basic studies, you, all, you, you guys have done basic accounting as well. In the basic accounting, teachers always teaches you one thing, that for reversal in the basic accounting, whatever expense you booked in the past, you can book that amount of income. Whatever expense you have booked in the past, now you can book that same amount of income now. So student asked one thing, look at here, that in the past, in the past, sir, we booked 270 impairment. In the past, open your eyes, we booked the expense of 270. And now after two years, after two years, when we are going to book the reversal, maximum reversal, this is only 210. Open your eyes, sir. In the past, in the past, we booked impairment of 270 expense. And now, and now, if we go for maximum reversal, the reversal is only 210. So what is the difference between 270 and 210? What, open your eyes, think over it. What is the difference between 270 and 210? This is 60 difference. So where this, where this 60 has gone? Where that, where that 60 has gone? Why IS has not allowed this 60? Giving you one logic, very excellent logic. This 60 is covered by, look at here, this 60 is covered by a new word I'm using, reduce depreciation. This 60, you have already taken benefit. You have already taken benefit of this 60 during these two years through reduce depreciation, through reduced depreciation. Wait, wait. Just think, because, just think because of him, this, look at here, because of this impairment, because of this impairment, your future depreciation becomes 70, 70 each year. Because of this impairment event, your future depreciation becomes 70, 70 each year. And just think if, if you don't be, if you, if this event won't happen, if this event won't happen, then your impairment would have been 100, 100. 
so because of this event because of this this impairment event your depreciation each year your depreciation reduced by 30 open your eyes and check each year your depreciation reduced by 30 so 30 this year and the 30 next year so that means during this two years journey during this two years journey because of this impairment you have already taken advantage of reduced depreciation of 30 and 30 that means you have already enjoyed you have already enjoyed the benefit of 30 and 30 60 you have already enjoyed the benefit of 30 and 30 60 that means your depreci your depreciation expense expense has already reduced by 60 so you have already in other words you have already booked a, an income of 60 in other words you have already booked an income of 60 during the journey so now you are only allowed to book reversal of 210 not getting because out of this 270 out of this 270 you have already enjoyed you have already enjoyed 30 and 30 reduced depreciation two years 30 and 30 60 so that means you have, you have already taken advantage of 60 so 270 minus 60 now you are only allowed to reverse 210 that's the key point very interesting point okay this was the logic that maximum is only 210 why Okay, let's end the class here. We'll do the remaining IS 36 in the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.